Hello, everyone. We're taking December off. Feel free to imagine us ensconced by a crackling fire in a log cabin deep in the woods with our loved ones, enjoying a warm mug of cocoa with lots of marshmallows. It's not true, of course. We're not allowed that much sugar anymore. But go ahead and imagine it anyway. We've once again bundled up the bonus episodes we put out for our top-tier supporters, which we call footnotes. They make two nearly hour-long collections for you to listen to, and we sincerely hope you enjoy them. If you'd like to get them when and as they release, head over to buymeacoffee.com slash fiddleback and become a member of our head librarian tier. You'll get lots of other benefits as well, like transcripts and early releases of our normal episodes. In the meantime, fix yourself up a mug of cocoa and have a listen to our 2021 holiday special, Part 2, which is also Episode 300. Enjoy. Back in December, we ran a series of special episodes in the hopes of cleaning up the cupboards around here a bit. As you'll recall, we had a lot of loose words running around here that didn't have a home, so we gave them one with a pair of lost episodes. Having rehomed our strays, we dusted off our hands and called the year done. Well, almost. Yes, technically the year was done, and we had rehomed all those words, but as is ever the case around here, there's always a bit more to learn. In this case, the word we just couldn't seem to be rid of was folly. Hopefully you'll recall that a folly, or at least one of the follies we covered, was a sort of garden decoration that got out of hand in Victorian England. People went around essentially building new ruins, so they could have something interesting to look at in the garden when all the plants got boring. So many fake Roman temples, false castle ruins, and faux Chinese pagodas were put up that an entire industry sprung up as one wealthy landowner after another tried to outdo each other. And it wasn't just confined to England either. Practically every European country got in on the act, along with India, Jamaica, and even Canada. And also, the United States. Which brings us around to the story we want to tell you about a place in Florida called Coral Castle. And it wasn't even a Victorian-era folly. It wasn't built until 1923. The story starts in Latvia with a young man named Edward Liedskalnen. At 26 years old, he was engaged to marry a girl 10 years his junior when, the day before his wedding, she suddenly called the whole thing off. Naturally upset, he took ship to America and headed to South Florida, as you do. Along the way, According to either Ed himself or one of those hearsay rumors that crop up around these sorts of things, he contracted tuberculosis, which supposedly nearly killed him, but fortunately was cured by Ed himself, thanks to the use of magnets. Which is, of course, where the story really starts to get interesting. Arriving in Florida City, Ed set about building Ed's place. Florida City is about as far south as you can get in Florida without having to swim at least part of the way. In 1923, it was a remote, underdeveloped place, which seemed to be just how Ed liked things. It let him work his magic in solitude. Mind you, we don't know that Ed ever called it magic himself, but certainly what Ed was about to do would be attributed, by others, to various mystical arts. Whether it made any sense or not. Ed began building a castle in the outskirts of Florida City. By hand. By himself. Over the next 15 years, he somehow built a castle out of what everyone said was coral. Great, big, huge slabs of coral that came from who knows where and who knows how. The slabs just showed up out of nowhere, nearly always the perfect size and shape to fit in exactly where they were needed. And of course... They were so heavy that no one could possibly have moved them by themselves. And Ed worked alone, and no one was ever able to watch him work to see what he was doing. Not that they didn't try. A group of boys once snuck in and watched him work. They claimed the massive stones floated around of their own accord, with Ed guiding them by the merest touch. 
His neighbors were constantly dropping in to see what he was doing and note any progress he made. Supposedly, he would stop working as soon as they appeared on scene and just wait until they left again before resuming. Naturally, this meant he worked in secret ways that weren't meant for the eyes of normal folks. Eventually, Ed just started charging a dime apiece to anyone who wanted to come look around and see what was going on. Ed would conduct the tours himself. As time went on, it became a sort of local tourist attraction. Now, the thing about Ed was, he was a small man. Wiry and skinny, most people say, not over 110 pounds, according to some. Yet he was somehow capable of lifting and moving 30-ton blocks into position to build his castle. Some claimed he used magnetism, others anti-gravity, and Ed did nothing to dispel the idea. In fact, it seems he actively encouraged it, even going so far as to write an incomprehensible book on the subject of magnetism. It doesn't reveal any secrets, nor does it demonstrate a complete understanding of the subject on the part of the author, but at least it gives you a bunch of experiments to do that may or may not result in severe burns or electrocution. Anyway, about 1935 or 36, something happens. Either he is mugged by a bunch of guys for what little money he had, or encroaching land development began to crowd the castle. Different versions of the story give different reasons. Nate Skalnan decided to up sticks and move the castle to a similar piece of land near Homestead, Florida, where it can be found today. To do so, he used not magnetism or anti-gravity, but the rather pedestrian method of loading it block by block onto trucks and driving to the new location. By now, the castle's reputation has spread far and wide, and so Ed begins charging people a quarter for tours of the reassembled castle. It becomes a more or less regular tourist stop for people far and wide. Something you won't find out by going to the Coral Castle website, or any of the many, many other sites that either claim to believe or have an interest in believing all the pseudoscience on hand, is how Ed did it all. How did a skinny little man lift tons of rock into the air and assemble a castle out of it all? Well, it turns out to be incredibly simple. If what you have is a lot of time and not much else to do, it's mostly hard work. And the mistake most people make when explaining how Ed accomplished it all is assuming that because they themselves don't want to put in the required amount of effort, neither does anyone else. And so they won't, which only leaves mysticism to explain things. In reality, Ed was a man with a lot of time and some good tools on hand to do the work with. It's just that simple. The castle isn't made of coral. It's made of something called oolite, which is basically a sedimentary type of rock made by sticking a bunch of small pebbles of calcium carbonate and other kinds of rocks together. Probably if you have an aquarium, you have a bunch of the stuff sitting at the bottom of it as a substrate. There may be coral in it, but it isn't coral. Numerous photographs of Ed taken over the years and of Ed's tool shed show just the sort of equipment you would need to cut, shape, lift, and move tons of rock around, even on your own. But we suppose that isn't interesting to the tourists, which is how Ed financed his admittedly ascetic lifestyle. It certainly wasn't interesting to Leonard Nimoy and the In Search of crew when they came around to film the place. You can find that online. What was interesting to everyone, though, was why Ed did it. Why spend all that time and effort building a ridiculous castle out in the middle of nowhere? Ed was happy to tell you. Having proved his worth by building Coral Castle, he was waiting for his sweet sixteen to return to him. His bride-to-be that never was. September was a little odd, what with a lost episode in the mix. In addition to the usual cleanup duties of lost episodes, we also got a couple of other items off our list with a short episode about whips and a much longer episode about giants. And really, we bypassed one of the more interesting cases of giants in history in order to streamline the episode a bit. But now that it is bonus episode time, 
we can tell you all about the most sensational giant of all time. The Cardiff Giant George Hole was, nominally, a tobacconist. At least, if anything could be said about the way he made his living, it was that he was most recently a tobacconist. Mostly. Hull was the sort of man who was always chasing the next big thing and never quite catching it. The only other definite thing you could say about Hull was that he was a confirmed and devout, if that word can be made to apply, atheist. Which is why, when he found himself in Iowa trying to smooth the way for a shipment of cigars and ran into a traveling revivalist preacher named Reverend Turk, he took against him almost immediately. The two men engaged in no small amount of verbal sparring about the veracity of the Bible. The conversation reached its thermal peak when Turk insisted that Genesis chapter 6 verse 4 was meant to be interpreted literally. For those of you unfamiliar with the verse in question, the first portion of it reads, There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that. Well, Hull became nearly apoplectic at the suggestion that such a thing was true. But that's the moment he says that he came up with his plan. To make a stone and pass it off as a petrified man. Hull reckoned that most people were gullible enough to buy it. So, over the next several years, Hull spent time and money organizing his object lesson to humanity. He had stone quarried in Iowa and shipped to Chicago, where it would be carved into the requisite shape. A shape which looked like a suitably enlarged George Hull, sans hair, but with at least one prominent... Let's call it a compliment, shall we? At any rate, Hull had the finished statue shipped to his brother-in-law, William Newell's farm. By now, nearly three years had passed since Hull's initial inspiration, but Hull remained unhurried and patient. The statue was buried behind Newell's barn, covered in clover, and allowed to settle. Finally, in October of 1869, Newell received word that he was to go ahead and discover the statue. The Washington, D.C. newspaper, National Republican, carried the story as follows. A fossil giant, singular discovery near Syracuse. A remarkable discovery has been made in the town of Lafayette, Onondaga County, New York. A human form of huge proportions, entirely petrified, was found under the following circumstances. About 12 miles south of Syracuse, near Cardiff, lives a farmer named William Newell. Saturday afternoon, in company with a hired man, he began to dig a well in a meadow in the rear of his barn. About two and a half feet below the surface, they struck upon what they supposed to be a large stone, and Mr. N went for a crowbar to remove it. Before he returned, however, his man had uncovered two large stony feet and legs. Continuing their digging, they brought to light the perfect figure of a man of more than a giant size, and as solid as though chiseled out of the rocks of Onondoga. Some conception of the sensation it has produced here may be formed when I give you a few of the actual measurements. The total length from the top of the head to the lower surface of the instep is 10 feet 2.5 inches. Across the shoulders the width is 3 feet. Across the palm of the hand 7 inches. The large finger is 8 inches long. The thigh is 12 inches. And the leg below the knee 9 and 1 third inches thickness. The figure was found lying on the right side, one hand placed upon the abdomen, the other upon the back, and the left leg thrown across the right. The resemblance is complete. Everything is there. The wrinkles about the eyes, the Adam's apple in the neck, the full veins, the prominent muscles and bones, the natural swell of each rib, the clearly defined nails, both of the hands and feet. The face and the features were decidedly Caucasian. The article goes on to say that the figure has been inspected by numerous experts from around Syracuse, and they, in their considered opinions, have decided that the fineness of the features, the perfection of its preservation, and the location it was found in all preclude the possibility that the Cardiff giant could be anything other than the petrified remains of an actual living being. So certain were they that there were already speculators on hand making offers to buy the figure outright with sums reaching into the tens of thousands. Newell had already set up shop himself inside a tent where he charged would-be viewers 50 cents a head to see the giant. 
Word spread and people came from miles around. Only one wrong note was sounded in the paper's reporting. One person, a Dr. J.F. Boynton, geologist and lecturer, had gone to see the giant and come back with the opinion that it was a statue and not a real person. Perhaps carved by a 16th or 17th century French Jesuit. The paper claimed this only made things all the more mysterious. By the weekend, as many as 2,600 people a day were going through the tent at least once to have a look, many of them having taken special trains at a dollar a seat to get there, and roadside eateries were springing up overnight to cater to the masses. It all came to an end eventually, of course. As more people were able to examine the statue, certain parts of the story behind it failed to add up. The gypsum used to make it was of a soluble kind, meaning that if it had lain in state where it was discovered for all those years, there was no way fresh tool marks would be visible on it. Never mind the fact that there were tool marks at all. Others pointed out that the location selected for the well did not particularly recommend itself to having a well put there, since there was no water to draw up in the area. Hull, however, was still getting a good laugh out of his interest in the giant as, for every objection that was raised, an equal raft of theologians and preachers stridently proclaimed the giant's authenticity. Eventually, Hull got out from under the hoax by selling his interest in the giant for what amounts to a half a million in today's money, to a five-man syndicate who then moved the giant to Syracuse itself for exhibition. P.T. Barnum famously offered to buy the giant for $50,000, but was turned down and so made his own covert copy of the giant and proclaimed it to be the original and the one owned by the syndicate a fake. The syndicate took Barnum to court, but found the judge to be unsympathetic, saying they would have to get the giant to testify to its own authenticity before they could make the case. Finally, in December of 1869, Two months after the giant had been discovered, Hull came clean and admitted everything to the press. In February, the case against Barnum was finally thrown out when the judge made the obvious point that the syndicate couldn't sue Barnum for calling their giant a fake when it was, in fact, fake. And you'll no doubt be interested to know that the man from the syndicate, David Hannum, had a most interesting quote when he was asked to comment on people rushing to see Barnum's copy of the giant under the pretense of it being the real deal. You see, it was he who said, there's a sucker born every minute, and not, as we've come to believe in the intervening years, Mr. Barnum himself. Boy, April and bits of May and March were certainly busy months around here. There was so much to do, and all of it was on one topic, the Persian Empire. No doubt you recall we started with Herodotus, who wrote the histories to explain to the Greeks why the Greeks and the Persians didn't get along for anyone who hadn't been paying attention. Then we covered the Medes as a sort of precursor to the Persian Empire, and after that we took on all three of the major kings of the Persians... Cyrus, Darius, and Xerxes, with a stop off in the middle at Marathon because someone had to explain that the Olympics has it all wrong. Along the way, we learned about the problems with learning about history, the importance of horses once again, how to successfully manage an empire, how to cleverly take an empire away from someone, the aforementioned problem with Olympic running, and what the Greeks finally learned about Greek politics. Well, what they almost learned. If you remember, the big wrap-up of the Persian series, and one of the main reasons the Persians couldn't take Greece, was that the Greeks had started to learn to work together. Now, as with any new enterprise, there was, of course, teething trouble. And it wasn't just that the Greeks were having to learn about this togetherness thing that was causing all the problems for them, either. Another of their big hang-ups was the all-new and shiny democracy they'd had installed in Athens. Probably the weirdest part of the way the Greeks went about it was the annual vote taken to see which of their politicians was going to win that year's award of a free 10-year-long exile. Sure, it was one way to flush the system and get some new politicians in, but it also led to a number of the problems they had with the Persians, as some of the exiled Greeks went running to the Persians to invite them to invade in the hopes of finding themselves in power again afterwards. 
Incidentally, the whole system of voting out politicians who displeased the people and sending them into exile was done, as we may have mentioned in the show, by writing the name of the person you were voting out on a piece of broken pottery and throwing it onto the appropriate pile to be counted. Basically, anyone who looked like they were going to upset the prosperity and stability of Greece was up for a vote when the time came. Well, the Greek word for potsherd and also for shell was ostracon. And the word for the whole process of exiling by vote with potsherds was ostracizain. And if you've been paying attention to how these sorts of things work, you've gotten to the next sentence before us. Ostracizain gave us the words ostracism and ostracize to exclude from a group by mutual consent. Oh, and ostracon also led to the word oyster, the shelled mollusk. Anyway, to further illustrate our point about the sort of goofy shenanigans this system brought about, we'd like to spend a few minutes talking about a fellow by the name of Themistocles, owner of possibly the world's most valuable face. Themistocles was born about 524 BCE and became an Athenian politician and general, which is something most politicians, and indeed most generals, did. However, Themistocles was a bit different from all the other politigenerals Athens had had up to that point. See, he wasn't a member of the aristocracy, which was something, until the trial run of democracy, you had to be to hold any real power in Athens up to that point. Instead, he was the darling of the lower classes, and so as a populist, got himself voted into the position. Amazingly, he was good enough at it that he found himself in 493 BCE, made Archon. Now, the exact history and usage of the word Archon is a bit fuzzy when it comes to what it meant at the time in Greece. But essentially it meant, during Themistocles' time, that he became one of three more or less rulers of Athens. Incidentally, Archon comes from the same root as words like monarch and hierarchy. Archons were basically the rulers. As Archon, Themistocles took a keen interest in the Athenian fleet, which, if you recall, there wasn't much of. He thought it was pretty important Athens should actually have a fighting fleet of ships, and fortunately, the Battle of Marathon came along to prove just how bad off Athens was without one. So, after the battle, in which he was probably one of ten generals involved in the fighting, and well aware that Persia wasn't done and would probably come back looking for more, and probably with the glory of the Battle of Marathon still radiating from him, Themistocles became the most important politician in Athens at the time, seemingly also he could convince the rest of Athens that what they really needed was a fleet of 200 triremes in order to keep Persia at bay when they came knocking for round two. Which they did. In fact, it was this fleet of Athenian ships that broke the Persian invasion. When the Persian fleet sailed into an ambush at the Straits of Salamis, it was an allied fleet of Greeks and their new triremes, commanded by Themistocles, that sprung the trap and severely weakened the Persian navy, and, by extension, the Persian army. Which is what made Xerxes hesitate, and eventually take most of the army back home to Persia, leaving a much smaller force which was eventually wiped out by the Greeks at the Battle of Plataea the following year. Well, naturally Themistocles was a sort of national hero, and he rode the wave of success to the top of Athenian politics. You might say that he began to feel that he was owed the glory for all his brilliant achievements, which we think you'll agree is never a good thought to think. Sure, he did do all the things he did in fact do, but he might have been better served to be a little more humble about it. And certainly, you don't want to upset the Spartans. What happened was this. Athens needed to be rebuilt because the Persians and Medes had more or less leveled the place. Themistocles, being in charge, ordered the rebuilding of Athens' defenses, including all her old fortifications. Well, the Spartans objected because they weren't certain yet that the Persians weren't coming back and they didn't want any place in Greece that the Persians could take and subsequently use as a fortress of their own. Themistocles went ahead and ordered the rebuilding anyway, but went off to Sparta to assure them that no, no, they definitely weren't rebuilding the fortifications pinky swear. 
He even invited the Spartans to come look for themselves, and they did. When they got there, the fortifications were all rebuilt and there was literally nothing the Spartans could do about it, especially because they simply couldn't breach those same fortifications to attack Athens itself and teach it a lesson. After that, Sparta never fully trusted Athens again and held a particular grudge against Themistocles for deceiving them. Meanwhile, his arrogance continued to grow, or so it seems. It might also just be that several prominent citizens had become jealous of Themistocles, and so things came to a head, and with Sparta actively working against him by this point, and even implicating him in the treason of one of their own generals, it wasn't long before Themistocles who had once been a hero of the common man, found himself ostracized, voted into exile. For a time, everywhere he attempted to settle, the Spartans were there with their accusations and threats soon after. Well, where do Greek exiles go when things go badly? That's right, Persia. By now, Xerxes' son, Artaxerxes, is on the throne, and Themistocles basically throws himself on the mercy of the king. In exchange for which, and for a year's grace to properly learn the Persian language, he would agree to serve Artaxerxes. Which is exactly the kind of thing a Persian king wants. Complete mastery over a dangerous and important foe. And we remember how Persia treated its enemies that capitulated. Pretty well, actually. Eventually, Themistocles is appointed governor of Magnesia, an Ionian city, a position he holds for the rest of his life. And you remember, we said he had probably the most valuable face ever? Well, if you remember our episode about coins, you recall King Croesus, who pops up in the Persian episodes as well. He created the first coins made of precious metals and set about revolutionizing the whole money thing. And while the coins minted by Croesus were the first anyone had ever seen, they were also something of a novelty because they mostly had things like representations of the gods, or the various commodities they were based on stamped on them as decoration and to indicate value. There were sheaves of wheat, pictures of cows, all sorts of things. Which means... When Themistocles had new coins minted for Magnesia, he needed to put something on them to distinguish them from all the other coins. And just what would a formerly very important person who still had a significant touch of arrogance about him, even after all this time, put on a coin? Why, his own face, of course. And so the first ever coins to bear the likeness of a living ruler on them came into being. In July, we discussed a number of interesting topics from the medieval joust, to the canon of our favorite shows, to the Swiss Army and their debilitating disease of nostalgia. Perhaps, though, you remember fondly our episode entitled Supernatural, in which we discussed not only the phenomena of spontaneous human combustion, but also how to lead your players into a supposed supernatural situation with completely mundane explanations. Now, as part of that research, we came upon many interesting facts, including that the most recent case of spontaneous combustion appears to have been that of Michael Faherty in 2010. His body was discovered by his neighbor when he found smoke pouring from Faherty's house early one morning. After an investigation, the coroner in the case ruled that Mr. Faherty had been a victim of spontaneous human combustion which startled more than a few people who figured the open fireplace he was found in front of would have had more to do with it. Still in all, it's incidents like this that keep people believing in the phenomena as an unexplained event with no rational cause, rather than a sad set of circumstances with a logical cause and effect if only one could look hard enough. But that was not the most interesting thing we turned up while working on the episode. Indeed, it was part of the research, but far more interesting to us, which is not to say amusing, were cases of, apparently, spontaneously exploding animals. That's right, exploding, not combusting. 
although presumably some of them did combust after the explosion. It is generally agreed that there are two causes for exploding animals, either through natural causes or because of human activity. You'll no doubt be aware of the case of an exploding whale right here in our own backyard. Well, not backyard exactly, but in our home state. In 1970, the carcass of a sperm whale washed ashore on the beach of Florence, Oregon, and the Oregon Highway Division, for reasons which may never make any actual sense, were tasked with disposing of it. As far as we know, there are no highways on the beach there, but there you go. Anyway, it was decided that the thing to do first was to break up the carcass, and the easiest way for the Highway Division to do this was to employ some strategically placed dynamite. Well, once you say dead whale and dynamite in the same sentence, everyone turns out to have a look at what will definitely not turn into an embarrassing fiasco for all concerned. Let's just say that no one within 800 feet of the whale and the dynamite thought they might need an umbrella that day when they started out, but they sure wished they had one afterwards. Some parts of the originally 45 foot long 16,000 pound whale landed on and totaled a new convertible car which had just been purchased by an explosive expert who happened for unrelated reasons to be in town that day and who had warned the crew working on the whale that 20 cases of dynamite was way too much. Turns out he was right. And you can see the results on YouTube thanks to a local news team recording of it. It's quite the video, and so much interest was generated in it after humorist Dave Barry wrote a column about it in the 90s that the residents of Florence voted to name their new recreation area Exploding Whale Memorial Park. But as well known as this is, this is not the sort of thing we mean. Instead, we want to talk about exploding animals without such obvious causes. It's noted that any number of dead animals will explode after death due to the buildup of post-mortem gases within the body cavity as they decay. And while this can be surprising if you aren't prepared for it, it's not particularly weird or strange, which you will admit was sort of the theme of our Supernatural episode. For instance, in April 2006, over the course of only a couple of days, over 1,000 toads exploded in Germany near Hamburg. People would just wake up in the morning and discover exploded toads all over the place. No one could quite explain why the toads were exploding, nor why so many of them were doing so, until a veterinarian from Berlin collected some of the corpses and performed necropsies on them. He theorized that a recent influx of crows was responsible, and if you can't quite see the connection, keep in mind that among crows, toad livers are apparently a delicacy. So at night, when the toads were out and about, the crows would swoop in and attack the toads, attempting to get at their livers. This would, apparently, create a small puncture in the toad, who, being attacked, would attempt to puff up to an intimidating size, and then, well, pop. All the toad liver a crow could want. A report from North Queensland, Australia, explains that a cow exploded in 1932 after having accidentally ingested a detonator. Not right away, of course, but later, while it was being milked and brought up its cud to have a nice chew. The farmer milking her was knocked unconscious by the blast. The cow did not survive. But really, the kings of the exploding animals are probably the ants and termites. Autothesis is a word that means self-sacrifice in Greek, but is called suicidal altruism by those who don't care what Greek words mean. Essentially, an animal practicing autothesis sacrifices itself for the good of the group, or in an ant's case, the good of the colony. Several species of termite have soldiers that can rupture a gland near the skin of their neck by contracting their muscles. This kills the termite in question, but also covers their attacker in a thick tar-like substance that not only traps the attacker, but also helps to block up the tunnel with corpses and victims and impede the progress of further attackers. It's a very effective tactic, as the one-for-one exchange of defender and attacker 
means that it costs a lot of energy and resources for any predators attacking the nest. In some species of termites, old workers develop copper proteins in blue spots on the abdomen that, when the termite explodes itself, produces a mixture toxic to other termites. But the champ has to be Campanatus saundersi. This ant has no interest in keeping you out of its tunnels. It expects you to die in combat when it explodes. Well, not you specifically, but whomever is attacking it. Which includes anthropods and some small vertebrates. Basically, these ants are all about defending territory. And while some ants develop stings to do this against larger predators, C. Saunderside discovered that exploding the colony of ants trying to encroach on your territory was much more effective than trying to sting them. The tail end of the ant is where all the action happens, and by contracting this, Saunderside can burst themselves, which sprays toxic and sticky goo all over the bad guys. In order to make this as effective as possible, the ant, sensing it is about to lose the fight, one presumes, wraps itself around its opponent and presses their back end directly to the other critter's head, guaranteeing maximum effect. And since the gland that produces the sticky toxin runs the entire length of the body, the explosion can cover not just the one the ant is fighting, but several of the other attacking critters as well, gluing them all in place and killing them along with the ant. And we're very, very sure that as a red-blooded GM, you probably can't wait to turn exploding giant ants loose on your heavily armored PCs just to, you know, see what happens. We bet it's fun. Fun happens. You may recall, though we barely do, that in the month of May we talked about a number of fun topics. We finished up the Persia series with Xerxes, then discussed a listener's suggestion about Chalcedony, and finished off with a lost episode full of other suggestions, including one from listener number 10,001 about weirbats, more or less. Well, you may remember that right smack in the middle of the month, we had an episode about nearly everyone's favorite hard-to-pronounce monster, the Sahu again which we are clearly going to keep pronouncing that way because it's official. Matt Mercer can recuse himself all he likes, but there you go. Official. It isn't the hardest monster's name to pronounce, of course, or indeed the hardest name in all of D&D. Not while a variety of demon lords, elven gods, and a drow who was hiding behind the door when vowels were passed out are still around. Of course, we happily told you about the origin of the word, such as was known, who came up with it, and what D&D supplements it was from. Along the way, we touched on nominative determinism, the super friends, and finally, Doctor Who, all in an effort to finally settle once and for all how to say Sahu again, which we have, because it's official. However, what we didn't touch on was some of the mythology behind the Sahu again, by which they were clearly inspired. To what do we refer? Well, on page 32 of the D&D supplement Monstrous Arcana, The Sea Devils, there's quite the section on the Sahuagin and their ability to control and communicate with sharks. In fact, the whole book is more than just a little sharky, with sections about weir sharks and shark weirs, and the susceptibility of Sahuagans to this particular kind of lycanthropy, even though we've already established that lycanthropy can only refer to wolves, and they want a whole different word entirely. But we've given up that battle as lost. In fact, the Sahuagin, yes, we're going to keep saying it that way, have a whole shark-based religion from which their beliefs spring. Their deity, Sekola, even uses massive great white sharks as his avatars. And one of the things about D&D is, the more you see of a particular subject or feature, the more likely it is that the thing has been cribbed from somewhere in the real world. One-offs are usually just a thing someone made up on the spot or for one particular purpose, and don't often have much of a backstory. But anything they keep harping on will have been out in the world already. You just have to go looking. So we did, and we found a fair bit of stuff, too. 
The reason, of course, that it didn't all make it into the episode in this case was because the general thrust of the episode was that you can pronounce made-up names any way you want, and no one can tell you it's right or wrong because, and we can't stress this enough, it's your game and you can do as you like. There just wasn't a lot of room to run off into shark-based mythology within that framework. Now, before we launch into further discussion, we just want to preface this by saying we are about to pronounce a lot of words quite wrongly. The difference here, from the way we did it discussing the Sahuagin, is that these words we are about to butcher have a completely valid oral tradition and pronunciation to which they refer. The problem, for us, is that the words are foreign to us, and use phonemes and combinations of phonemes with which we are unfamiliar. A phoneme, by the way, is the smallest phonetic unit of a language from which meaning can be derived. We're all for making silly fantasy names yours by pronouncing them as you see fit at your table, but when it comes to real names of real things that are important to real people, well, we do try to do our best. But being American, we're already working with a handicap. We'll do our best, and we mean no offense. Hawaii has a fascinating and varied religion centered, as you might imagine, around the things which are most frequently observed on the chain of islands making up the state. The goddess Pele, for instance, is the goddess of volcanoes and fires, and also credited with creating the Hawaiian Islands in the first place. A natural enough belief given that you can watch the lava flowing into the sea and making more island without too much effort even to this day. And, being a people that live next to the sea on all sides, they, of course, have a number of gods related to the animals of the sea, not the least of which is the shark. Kamohoa Li'il is a shark god and brother to several other gods, including Pele. He swims around the island of Maui and Kaho'olawe, and if given a particular drink, he will guide men lost at sea back home. He's even credited with showing the first Hawaiians the way to Hawaii from the original homeland in exactly this way. Ka'ahu Pa'ahu, the queen of sharks, along with her brother Kahiuka, were originally humans but transformed into sharks, possibly when their mother, believing them stillborn, dumped them into the sea. According to the stories, they both patrolled the entrance to what is now Pearl Harbor, watching out for man-eating sharks and keeping them away from the people. Kaneapua was the trickster shark god of Hawaiian lore, and Kane El Kakala was a shark god with a reputation for saving the survivors of shipwrecks. In the ongoing war between good sharks and man-eaters, Ki'ali Ika'u Oka'au was one of those heroes along with his four shark companions. And finally, Kuai Moana was a shark god at least 55 meters long, who would ensure bountiful catches and thankfully was on the side of good. We don't know what other powers he might have had, but he was bigger than a megalodon, so that was probably sufficient to win most fights. Not to be left out of the shark god fun, the Fiji Islands had Dakuwaka, who protected fishermen from dangers at sea, even though in the Mutant Masterminds RPG they turned him into a bioweapon from Atlantis. The Bahamas had Lasku, some sort of half-shark, half-octopus that specialized in sinking ships, drowning swimmers, and making whirlpools. So not all shark gods were good, though a lot of them were. Maybe he just didn't get the memo. Sharks come in in other ways as well. There are stories around Brazil and Guyana about Nohia Basi, who trained a shark to eat his mother-in-law when he got tired of her, but this backfires and he ends up losing his leg, which then becomes the belt in the constellation Orion. For some reason. The Maori have a story about a king who turns his daughter's unfit suitor into a shark, only to later have everyone on the island rescued by him after a tsunami. And in Zanzibar, there's the story of the monkey and the shark, both of whom were pretending to be friends with the other for their own purposes. The moral of which ends up being, never trust a monkey or a shark, in case you were in danger of doing either of those things. Which we were not. Funny though, isn't it? So many stories about good shark gods protecting and helping their people, and yet the Sahuagin got saddled with Sakola, who just doesn't care about them at all, really, so long as the sacrifices keep coming. 
must be a Jaws thing. In October, we went on an expedition looking for Bigfoot, discussed the charming effects of love potions, and kicked off a month of support from the bearded in the hopes of bringing an end to cancer, all in an effort to experience some real, genuine warm fuzzies. Perhaps no story we did was more representative of the actual difference between what warm fuzzies are and what we think they are than the story of Beauty and the Beast. The real story of Beauty and the Beast, not the Disney version. As we pointed out at the time, when you really dig into the story, there is very little to feel warm and fuzzy about. And most of what we claim makes us feel so good about Belle and the Beast just isn't in the original at all. It's all been added after the fact by other people who've tried to adjust the original author's intent to more properly suit the then current zeitgeist. And it still goes on to this day. But even when it was first written, Beauty and the Beast was derivative of other works. See, there is a rich vein of folklore and fairy stories that is more or less being constantly exploited whenever a new story is written, especially if that story is meant to teach us some sort of moral lesson. And Beauty and the Beast was certainly trying to do that. We didn't point it out in the episode proper because it was more fun to do things our way, but the story is meant to deliver an important message to young brides everywhere. Which is, basically, shut up and marry who your parents tell you to, you'll learn to love them eventually. No, seriously, it's all about preparing young girls for arranged marriages. Go back and listen to the episode again if you don't believe us. It totally makes sense once you see it through that lens. Here's the beast. He's beastly and uncouth and given to fits of passion and not at all house-trained. But look at all the money and power he has. That'd be good for our family to have. So why don't you let's marry him and we can all get the benefits of that wealth and influence and all you have to do is fake it till you make it. You can learn to love him. Easy peasy. Suddenly everyone's motivations are much more clear. And just to make one more thing clear, the story wasn't written for children. It was originally intended to be read in the wealthy salons and sitting rooms of France to and by the adults. It wasn't until 15 years after it first came out that it was rewritten as a story for children and considerably softened. In any case, the original story was itself derivative of several earlier stories, in particular Cupid and Psyche. The story of Cupid and Psyche was first written down by Platonicus in the 2nd century CE as part of a larger tale called The Golden Ass. The Golden Ass is all about a man transformed into a donkey by some wayward magic, who then goes on to have many different trials and adventures before finally being returned to human form. Which already sounds a lot like the Beauty and the Beast tale, but apparently wasn't an obvious enough metaphor at the time, and so needed a second deeper story to really drive whatever the point was home. So along comes the story of Cupid and Psyche. Psyche is the third and youngest, and therefore most beautiful, daughter of a king and queen of some far-off land. So beautiful is she, that all the local boys forget they're meant to be worshipping and revering the goddess of love, Venus, and instead pray and make sacrifices to Psyche. They even go so far as to claim Psyche is really Venus given mortal form. Well, Venus is, quite naturally, offended by all this and vows to take Psyche out of the picture for good. So she calls up her son Cupid with his little arrows and says, Go shoot Psyche with one of your little darts and make her fall in love with something terrible and ugly. And off Cupid goes to do the job. Which of course fails. But not because Psyche is so drop-dead gorgeous, rather, Cupid stupidly mishandles one of his arrows and scratches himself with it just as he is about to take aim at Psyche. Instead of shooting her and making her fall in love with a grotesque, he falls in love with her instead. Now, because of this, a lot of things happen that are sort of, well, complicated, let's say. Psyche's sisters all get married, but Psyche doesn't. No one even asks. So her father, the king, begins to suspect a curse and consults an oracle who not only confirms a curse, but also explains that Psyche is going to be the reason the entire world is destroyed by the sort of world-ending monster you get in these kinds of tales. 
It's so bad even the underworld fears it, and that's saying something. So Dad decides the only thing to do is to sacrifice Psyche to the gods. Up they climb to a mountain, he offers her up, but instead of being killed and dying, the wind picks her up and carries her away to far off parts. She doesn't know it, but she's been wed to Cupid at the same time she was sacrificed to the gods. She finds out though, eventually, when she wakes up in a field and is guided by an unknown voice to a magnificent house in which she is told to make herself comfortable. Oh, and every night a mysterious stranger comes and has sex with her until, and we hate to use this phrase but this is how it happens in the story, she gets used to it and learns to like it. It's Cupid of course, but he is apparently very shy about telling Psyche who he is and what he's about. She misses her family though, and so Cupid arranges for her sisters to come visit. They can't believe she doesn't know who she's been sleeping with, and hatch a plan for her to finally discover his identity. After all, it could be the monster from the prophecy, and she wouldn't want all that to happen, would she? Well, when she carries out the not-so-clever plan, she discovers Cupid laying in bed with her, asleep. In her excitement, she pricks herself with one of his arrows, and falls in love with him. As a way of saying how much she now loves him, she accidentally spills hot oil on him, scaring him off and away. In stumbling around and chasing after him, she eventually runs into her sisters again back at their home. She tells them who she's been sleeping with all this time, and they instantly become so jealous of her that they try to offer themselves to the gods too. But when they fling themselves from the same mountaintop she did, the wind takes one look at them and says, uh uh and allows them to fall to their deaths. Anyway, a lot of other things happen. So much so that the book, The Golden Ass, turns out not to be so much about the adventures of the titular character as it is about the story of Cupid and Psyche. Psyche visits some temples to other gods, and thanks to some good work she does there, manages to get them on her side, even though they can do nothing to help her against Venus. So Psyche goes to the temple of Venus and offers up her services there. Venus is, of course, delighted to have her as a servant, and takes every opportunity to make Psyche miserable. A number of tasks are set for her which Venus thinks are impossible to complete, but aided variously by ants, a reed, and an eagle, she manages to get them all done. However, Venus has one more task for Psyche, which she manages to botch. Cupid finally recovers from the hot oil wound though, and finds Psyche. He saves her from her fate and gets Zeus's official permission to finally marry her properly in exchange for doing pimp services for Zeus whenever he fancies some mortal woman. Psyche is then fed ambrosia to make her immortal, and the couple live happily ever after. Literally. With a pedigree like that, you can see how Beauty and the Beast was pretty well doomed to be not for kids from the start. And we haven't even told you the one about a hedgehog named Hans. Happy holidays, and thank you for your continued support.